Hello everyone, welcome to the next review. I've not done a re review for quite a long time. It's an interesting one today, uh, 51 Tales by Lord Dunzany. In the past maybe week or so, week and a half, I decided to change my thesis idea specifically to looking at uh, Lord Dunzany's fiction. Um, I'm interested in liminality, non afrocentrism in Dunzany's fiction, so I decided to change my thesis on that and I will actually be, if anyone's interested, making a video on that very topic. What I've read about, what I've read of Dunzany, what I've not read, what I think about his fiction. Um, currently reading a few things, so I might put a, a fairly longish video on that if anyone's interested. But for now, Fifty One Tales by Lord Dunzany. It's a collection of prose poems. Some of them are short stories, but most of the Fifty One Tales here don't extend over two pages or so. So it's quite um, quite brief. It's about one hundred and four pages in total as well. So it's it's quite a short read. All of his main themes and concerns here, I think, are kind of represented through all, through, throughout all of these 51 tales. The destruction of nature, the noise of modern cities, um, the destructive nature of time, his um, scepticism about religion, things like this. What's interesting as well is that because of the kind of the faceless nature of the book. I mean, it's called 51 Tales, kind of reminiscent of 1001 Nights, that sort of thing. Um, because of the kind of generalised cover art as well, I, I wasn't really a fan of the cover art to be honest, so I just took the, the slip cover off, but um, because of the kind of generalised nature of that as well, it feels like it's, I don't know, it, it just it contains all of these different themes and ideas and images. It, it kind of doesn't really feel like Donzani, but it also does as well. It's a strange one. Um, and it also kind of, it feels like it's, it contains with, within it, not only Duns and his kind of jeweled ornate prose, and also some kind of some of his more modernistic style as well, and his comedy as well, but it also has that connection to Lovecraft, Mackin, um, Clark Ashton Smith in some of the tales as well. So it feels like it has a lot for everyone, despite the fact that it's a very short book, and I think it's, 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 uh, it's definitely worth reading, however, this cost me uh, thirteen ninety nine to buy. It's far too much for a for a one hundred four page book. I think it is. I feel like I feel like I just had to have it in the collection. To be honest, it's a very obscure book, but it's uh, it's actually quite relevant to the thesis as well. So without further ado, let's get into some of the tales. The assassination. Just to give you an idea. Just very first story. Fame, singing in the highways, and trifling as she sang with sordid adventurers, passed the poet by. And still the poet made for her little chaplets of song, to deck her forehead in the course of time. And still she wore instead the worthless garlands, that boisterous citizens flung to her in the ways, made out of perishable things. And after a while, whenever these garlands died, the poet came to her with his chaplets of song. And still she laughed at him, and wore the worthless wreaths, though they always died at evening. And one day in his bitterness, the poet rebuked her and said to her, Lovely fame, even in the highways and the byways you have not forborne to laugh and shout and jest with worthless men. And I have toiled for you and dreamed of you, and you mock me and pass me by. And fame turned her back on him and walked away. But in departing she looked over her shoulder and smiled at him, as she had not smiled before, and, almost speaking in a whisper, said, I will meet you in the graveyard at the back of the workhouse in a hundred years. So a lot of these stories read like this, they're very allegorical. They deal with um, the personifications of time, nature, decay. For that reason, I don't think that they necessarily have to be read back to back. This book isn't really a cover to cover affair, I don't think. Um, I found them a little bit repetitive, if I'm being honest. There's quite a lot in here that kind of repeats the same themes and a lot of the stories are quite obvious, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The very next story is Sharon, which I have read on the channel. It's one of my favourite prose poems, so I'll just link you to that, but it's actually one of my favourite by far. This, this, this line alone is just extraordinary. If the gods had even sent him a contrary wind, it would have divided all time in his memory into two equal slabs. Fantastic. Sharon is one of my favourite prose poems. So just to give you an idea of, the again, the kind of allegorical nature which pervades this book. There's an entire story called Wind and Fog, you know, it's not really one of my favourites, but I will just read the, the very beginning. Way for us, said the north wind as he came down the sea on an errand of old winter. 
and he saw before him the grey silent fog that lay along the tides. Way for us, said the north wind, O ineffectual fog, for I am winter's leader in his age-old war with the ships. One of my favourites in the collection is the Wrath Builders. It's actually inc it was included in the in the Land of Time and Other Fantasy Tales, which is the second Dungeon book that I ever read. But I'll just read it here, since I don't believe I've actually covered it in, in the video. All we who write put me in mind of sailors hastily making rafts upon doomed ships. When we break up under the heavy years and go down into eternity, with all that is ours, our thoughts like small lost rafts float on a while above oblivion's sea. They will not carry much over those tides, our names and a phrase or two and little else. They that write as a trade to please the whim of the day. They are like sailors at work at the rafts, only to warm their hands and to distract their thoughts from their certain doom. The rafts go all to pieces before the ships break up. See now oblivion shivering all around us, its very tranquillity deadlier than tempest. How little all our keels have troubled it. Time in its deeps swims like a monstrous whale, and, like a whale, feeds on the littlest things, small tunes and little unskilled songs of the olden golden evenings, and anon turn of whale-like to overthrow whole ships. See now the wreckage of Babylon floating idly, and something there that once was Nineveh. Already their kings and queens are in the deeps among the weedy masses of old centuries that hide the sodden bulk of sunken Tyre and make a darkness round Persepolis. For the rest, I dimly see the forms of foundered ships on the sea floor strewn with crowns. Our ships were all unseaworthy from the first. There goes a raft that Homer made for Helen. Time and the Tradesman Once time, as he prowled the world, his hair grey not with weakness but with dust of the ruin of cities, came to a furniture shop and entered the antique department. And there he saw a man darkening the wood of a chair with dye and beating it with chains and making imitation wormholes in it. And when time saw another doing his work, he stood, up, he stood by a while and looked on critically. And at last he said, That is not how I work. And he turned the man's hair white and bent his back and put some furrows in his little cunning face, then turned and strode away for a mighty city that was weary and sick and too long had troubled the fields, was sore in need of him. It's one of my favourites. Very, very simple. A lot of these stories are admittedly quite simple, quite obvious, and in fact, one of my least favourite parts of this, this short book is the fact that Dunsany labours the point. He, he will flat out just call something evil, the evil glaring factories. Feels a bit obvious, feels a bit simple. But there are also, which I will get to, Stories that feel more like Dunsany's Pagan mythology, which I felt were almost kind of sorely missing in this, or sorely needed in this collection. A lot of these stories are like Time and the Tradesman and others, the other stories that I read previously, but there are some stories that do remind me of Dunsany's true prose style and his language, his made up fantastical worlds, his, his fantastical names. Another very short one, this is incredible. The Worm and the Angel As he crawled from the tombs of the fallen, a worm met with an angel. And together they looked upon the kings and kingdoms, and youths and maidens and the cities of men. They saw the old men heavy in their chairs and heard the children singing in the fields. They saw far wars and warriors and walled towns, wisdom and wickedness and the pomp of kings, and the people of all the lands that the sunlight knew. And the worm spake to the angel, saying, Behold my food. And the, the angel murmurs a, a Greek line from the Iliad, which I believe it's actually written in Greek, so I can't quite replicate it, but it's, uh, it's a line from Homer, saying something like, Thus he walked by the sea, or thus he saw the, the sea. This line murmured the angel, For they walked by the sea. And can you destroy that too? And the worm paled in his anger to a greyness ill to behold, for for three thousand years he had tried to destroy that line, and still its melody was ringing in his head. This idea that Homer's sing the single line of Homer cannot be destroyed, fantastic. Just an example of the quite unfortunately obvious direction that a lot of these prose poems go. The Songless Country, I'll just read the very end of it. 
the, the, the context is that there's a, a poet who's trying to bring song to the songless country. He offers to bring them a song and they say, if you think we have time for that sort of nonsense nowadays, you cannot know much of the progress of modern commerce. And the poet wept for he said, alas, they are damned. He's making a point, but it also doesn't really feel like, it, it's just, it doesn't really go anywhere. It's just, it, it's, it's so obvious that it feels, it doesn't really move you. It didn't, didn't really move me, despite the fact that I, I deeply, I, I'm writing a thesis on Dunsany because of his appreciation of nature and beauty and art. But uh, it, just, it just didn't really move me that much. The return of song. The swans are singing again, said to one another the gods. And looking downwards, for my dreams had taken me to some fair and far Valhalla, I saw below me an iridescent bubble, not greatly larger than a star shining beautifully but faintly, and up and up from it, looking larger and larger, came a flock of white innumerable swans, singing and singing and singing, till it seemed as though even the gods were wild ships swimming in music. What is it? I said to one that was humble among the gods. Only a world has ended, he said to me, and the swans are coming back to the gods, returning the gift of song. A whole world dead, I said. Dead, said he that was humble among the gods. The worlds are not forever, only song is immortal. Look, look, he said, there will be a new one soon. And I looked and saw the larks going down from the gods. That one very much reminds me of, it's got goosebumps in fact, that one really reminds me of the Bagana mythology stories, like the River of Silence and things like this. Um, specifically though, the, the image of the iridescent bubble, like a world being a bubble just popping out of existence, um, a very, very neat image. A lot of them don't really feel like that, unfortunately. There are very dreamlike stories, but I kind of wanted them to to really stick in my mind more, and that one definitely does. A story that I definitely did remember for its imagery, and in fact, when I read this, it was a strange feeling of um, remembering that I was actually reading a Dunsany collection. How the enemy came to Thunrana, the secret in the dark, the gate of the doom, the chief cathedral of wizardry, the black thatched cottage among the pine trees, the black marble chamber, so now that I think about it, this story is very much, in fact, like uh, the fortress unvanquishable save for Sacknall. So this is a fantastic Dunsany story. It's a story about this supposed doom that's going to fall upon the city of Thlunrana in this dark valley. And one man goes to see Thlunrana before it falls to try and understand what that doom might entail. The nature of the destruction of Thlunrana. It's a fantastic story, um, really got some very strong images and uh, I think it really is a kind of a metaphor for how restrictive and dominating ideologies can be dismantled very, very simply. Well, that's all I'll say, it's a fantastic story. This next story, The City, I can't quite remember if I talked about this in my In the Land of Time and Other Fantasy Tales review, but uh, I, I will read The City, one of my favourite of Dunsany's works. In time, as well as space, my fancy roams far from here. It led me once to the edge of certain cliffs that were low and red and rose up out of the desert. A little way off in the desert, there was a city. It was evening, and I sat and watched the city. Presently, I saw men by threes and fours come softly stealing out of that city's gate, to the number of about twenty. I heard the hum of men's voices speaking at evening. It is well they are gone, they said. It is well they are gone. We can do business now. It is well they are gone. And the men that had left the city sped away over the sand and so passed into the twilight. Who are these men? I said to my glittering leader. The poets, my fancy answered. The poets and artists. Why do they steal away? I said to him. And why are the people glad that they have gone? He said, it must be some doom that is going to fall on the city. Something has warned them, and they have stolen away. Nothing may warn the people. I heard the wrangling voices, glad with commerce, rise up from the city. And then I also departed, for there was an ominous look on the face of the sky. And only a thousand years later I passed that way, and there was nothing, even among the weeds, of what had been that city.
fantastic story about um, ivories as a kind of the, the, the folly of only um, cultivating kind of the non-aesthetic life and commerce and things like this. I'll just end on a more humorous one, because Dungeon does have humour in quite a lot of his stories, especially his later ones. Feels like I could have written this, although I, I probably wouldn't have written it in this in this style or this way, but it's just a fantastic um it, it's about four sentences and it just sums up so much. What we have come to. When the advertiser saw the cathedral spires over the downs in the distance, he looked at them and wept. If only, he said, this were an advertisement of beefo, so nice, so nutritious. Try it in your soup, ladies like it. Dunsany hated advertisements, he hated the destruction of nature, the removal of song and beauty and art and wonder from modern life, exactly why I'm doing my thesis on him, despite the fact that I am not really a fan of some of his later stories. So that was 51 Tales, very short book but there's a lot in there, there's a lot that's said in this book. So thanks for watching everyone, until next time.